Did you know that long before man came along, gigantic plants towered over the surface of the earth? Would a world without plants be possible? Without plants, there would be no animals since they depend on them to live. So we wouldn't be here to talk about it. The first plant appeared on Earth around 500 million years ago. At the time, it seemed an insignificant detail, yet our planet was to change forever. This tiny green algae remains the ancestor of all the incredible plants we know today. Initially established in water, plants began to invade dry land around 470 million years ago. A complex change, since they needed a protective layer to prevent them from drying out. The plants that conquered the Earth were bryophytes, non-vascularized plants resembling today's mosses, which thrived in damp areas. Lycopods then arrived, with their advanced vessel system enabling them to grow and rise high above the ground. Thus, 350 million years ago, they formed some of the first forests. The first land plants reproduced using tiny spores. The revolution came with the arrival of gymnosperms, which have seeds. This new characteristic was essential for the conquest of the Earth. Seeds have the ability to lie dormant until the right conditions are created for them to germinate. From now on, plants are no longer restricted to damp habitats, and nothing can stop them. Nevertheless, although they grow on land, the landscape remains monochrome, green. Then, 140 million years ago, an explosion of color occurred on our planet. Flowering plants, or angiosperms, appeared. Their colors, smells, and sweet tastes attract insects, animals, and birds, encouraging them to disperse their pollen and seeds. The landscape evolves and takes on a very different appearance. Our planet now offers a veritable palette of colors. It's thanks to evolution that plants have been able to conquer the Earth. Gradually, through tiny changes and over time scales corresponding to many generations, they have mutated. Random modifications to their genes control plant growth. These mutations, which in most cases reduce the plant's chances of survival, sometimes give it an advantage, pushing it into a new type of habitat. The plant then passes this mutation on to its descendants. This is the process of natural selection. Plants evolve to such an extent that at some point they reach colossal sizes. These giant plants on prehistoric Earth are fascinating, but they're not there just for decoration. They play a crucial role in the prehistoric ecosystem, providing various benefits that have shaped life on Earth. How did plants grow from tiny algae to such colossal sizes? What did they look like? Do they still exist today? Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we're exploring the past to discover the giant plants of ancient times. But before we set off on a new adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing. Thank you and have a great trip. Plants are defined as living beings that supply, among other things, the oxygen humans need to live. They are photosynthetic, autotrophic, organic beings that are born, grow, and die. Plants have no motor capacity and do not move on their own. They feed mainly on water and light. The first plants to arrive on Earth don't look at all like most of those we know today. 
Yet they all evolve from these primitive algae, which today form the first link in the food chains necessary for human and animal life. Algae are living organisms that produce oxygen through photosynthesis and whose life cycle takes place mainly in aquatic environments. While some species are tiny isolated cells, others form veritable giant underwater forests. Algae are an extremely important part of biodiversity and form the basis of major food chains. Marine algae live in the salt water of the oceans, while other algae live in fresh water. The first algae found on Earth date back 500 million years, but recent research has brought to light tiny fossils of an algae called Proterocloudus antiquus. It was found in China and dated back a billion years. This tiny alga forms vast green mats on shallow seabeds. Its slender thread-like branches, smaller than an ant, sway with the current on the seabed. Its structure and branching suggest that it grew upright on the seabed, aggregating into thick clumps. Proterocladus antiquus is thought to be the common ancestor of all terrestrial plants that appeared on Earth 500 million years later. Initially, these algae were confined to the aquatic environment. The continental surface was devoid of life. The only landscape is rock, like a vast desert, but with a few rivers. It is these rivers that will enable life to free itself from water, offering plants the opportunity to occupy an ecological niche. Thus, around 500 million years ago, plants closely resembling today's lichens and mosses conquered dry land. These first occupants clung to the rocks and hugged every nook and cranny. Water did not yet circulate in their tissues. So, to resist dehydration, they have the ability to revive. Plants dry out completely when there isn't enough water and rehydrate as soon as the rain returns. Other plants adopt a different strategy. They equip themselves with an impermeable cuticle to reduce water loss or specialized openings to maintain gas exchange. These features enable them to withstand a long period without water. The spores they produce and disperse have a protective envelope made of a substance resembling arthropod chitin, which prevents them from drying out. These first plants have a more or less similar appearance. They form small, somewhat branched axes. They have no leaves. They may be recumbent or erect, and their vascularization is very primitive. This doesn't prevent them from colonizing the aerial and mineral environment, providing raw materials for microorganisms to break down. This activity led to the formation of the first plant soils. Plants, most of them self-sufficient, begin the conquest of a new environment and later become a source of food for other species, such as land animals. In the image of Proterocladus, we tend to think of these first algae as tiny. And yet, over the years, certain species of algae grew to considerable size, forming veritable underwater forests. Some are still present today, and still invade our seabed. Examples include Macrocystis and Sargassum. The first Macrocystis is also known as Giant Kelp. It's one of the most impressive of the algae, since it's the fastest growing living organism on Earth. Its long, slippery brown fronds can grow up to 60 centimeters or 25 inches per day. 
It belongs to the brown algae family, which appeared 200 million years ago, and the species is thought to have started developing 5 million years ago. The seaweed attaches itself to the rocky bottom by means of strong spikes. It has fronds, not leaves, which float to the surface. Macrocystis can extend up to 60 meters or 200 feet by spreading out at the surface to take advantage of light for photosynthesis. The fronds are green to brown in color. Seaweed stems are 3 to 5 centimeters or 2 feet in diameter. In order to hold on tightly, the spikes branch out and intertwine around the substrate until they form a mass. Macrocystis only thrives in cold water and cannot tolerate temperatures above 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. It never establishes itself beyond 30 meters or 100 feet depth, as these young plants need light for their development. Its exceptional growth is spore-driven, These immense forests provide a habitat for many species, both in the fronds and around the spikes. Macrocystis still exists today. It can be found in the eastern Pacific Ocean, from Mexico to western Canada, in the western Pacific Ocean from Mexico to western Canada, in the western Pacific Ocean in New Zealand, and also in the southern Indian Ocean. Sargassum is a brown algae that forms vast patches in calm blue water. It can grow to several meters in length. It provides a valuable habitat for fish and other inhabitants that take shelter among the algae fronds. On land, the group of green algae that remains firmly established in lakes, rivers, and ponds are the charophytes. This group of eukaryotes with cell nuclei includes a variety of algae. Among them is Paleonatella, a tiny fossil algae discovered in a formation called the Rhiney Chert in Scotland. Chert is a type of rock composed mainly of silica. Entire communities of ancient plants and animals have been preserved in remarkable detail in the Rhiney Chert. Among them, Paleonatella may well be the great-great-great-grandfather of many modern cherophytes. Dating back over 400 million years, the Rhiney Chert is a fossil-bearing sedimentary deposit. It was discovered in Scotland in 1912 and has been studied ever since. The Rhiney Chert is exceptionally well preserved in plant fossils such as algae and terrestrial plants. It also contains fungi and animals such as nematodes and arthropods. Three-dimensional petrification reveals the internal structure of organisms Indeed, some animals and plants have been fossilized right down to their cellular ultrastructure. The age of the site is interesting, as at this Devonian period, the Earth was at an early stage in the colonization of its continental surfaces by living beings. The chert consists of siliceous rocks produced by hot springs, which are numerous in this region due to volcanism. The Rhiney site is home to numerous freshwater algae, cherophytes, fungi, and the first known lichen, or rather pseudolichen, Winfrenachia reticulata. On this site, plants share space and resources and distribute themselves according to environmental conditions. It's evidence of a thriving plant community.
Lechera is a little-known genus of green algae with one of the most complex algal structures. In early modern botany, their appearance even led to them being associated with vascular plants such as horsetails. In the end, they are indeed green algae, with features in common with certain land plants. These freshwater algae have been around since at least the Silurian period, 430 to 410 million years ago. They live attached to the muddy beds of rivers and lakes. Their feathery fronds form large green clouds beneath the water's surface. They are characterized by giant cells, one to two centimeters or one inch long, and their thallus can reach up to 1.20 meters or four feet. They provide a green oasis for other living organisms in the same area and keep the water clean and clear. The little world teeming with life that we can observe today on a stone wall, a path, or even a tree is like a miniature forest of plants called bryophytes. The best known of these are mosses, but there are also liverworts with their flat creeping fronds and anthocerotes with their complex horn-like structures. Plants are now conquering the earth. Dawsonia is a genus of moss that is taller than most and has thicker leaves. In fact, it's the tallest moss in the world. It has special tubes or vessels that move water over greater distances. Thanks to this system, it has a particularity not found in any other moss. It can stand up to 60 centimeters high. Zosterophyllum is a plant that existed 400 million years ago during the Devonian period and had a distinctive appearance. It is covered with small spines and coiled branches. It is one of the first plants to possess a system of vessels with veins like the plants and trees we know today. It was the first step towards a more complex group of plants known as lycopods. The first terrestrial plants were very simple, self-sufficient organisms with no conducting vessels. They are completely autotrophic. All they need is water, CO2, and light. However, to obtain light, the plant must not be covered by another plant. An evolutionary advantage lies in rising towards the light or increasing the surface area of light receptors. For example, Species of the Rhinia genus found at the Rhiney Church site have spines that capture more light. Leaves then develop like solar panels useful for photosynthesis. The Devonian period is marked by an explosion of plant forms. The vessel system developed, allowing water and nutrients to circulate throughout the plant. Rhizoids appear. These are absorbent hairs that enable the organism to attach itself to its substrate. Next come the roots, enabling the plant to recover mineral resources from the soil, as well as water. Lignin stiffens the tissues, and the plant can grow even higher. The first fossil leaves are structures known as microfills. Some lycopods have them. At the end of the Devonian period, around 360 million years ago, plants developed a new type of leaf called a megafill. These were more complex with more veins. They may even have evolved from branches. These new leaves changed the atmosphere and life on Earth forever. 
Euphilophyton is one of the oldest plants known to have produced megaphils. Its leaves are tiny, between 2 and 6 millimeters long, and grow in pairs. They have branched veins so that some appear to be webbed and spread out at different angles. Spores develop on the underside of leaves. Lycopods are the oldest group of vascular plants still present today. Their physiology is similar to that of our modern plants. Although the latter are rather small, a few hundred million years ago, their ancestors were majestic trees covered with long leaves. Baraguanathia appeared towards the end of the Silurian and lasted through the Devonian. It was one of the very first plants to produce true leaves. It has solid tubes that absorb nutrients and water from the soil. Although its size may seem relatively modest to us today, as tall as a small bush of a meter or three feet, Baraguanathia was ahead of its time and outstripped all other land plants of the time. Its descendants will continue to grow and cover the earth with great green forests. The first miniature forest took shape, notably Proto-Pido-Dendropsis. At four meters or 13 feet tall, they grow in thickets spaced far apart. Their trunks are only 10 centimeters or 4 inches wide, but wider at the base. But while plants are undergoing a veritable biological revolution, a newcomer is about to make a big splash in terms of evolution in size. While the reproduction of the first plants to colonize dry land remains strictly dependent on water, the appearance of seeds enabled them to free themselves from their original environment. Spermatophytes, the seed-producing plants, developed slowly around 390 million years ago. The elements that ensure the plant's dissemination are no longer spores but seeds. The latter are protected by several protective envelopes filled with lignin, which contains not only an embryo, but also all the reserves necessary for its development in the early stages, i.e. carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. The seed detaches itself from the plant and ensures the dissemination of the species. To do this, it possesses a number of assets such as its tiny size, hooks enabling it to attach itself to animals, and appendages providing a grip on the wind. It's a real botanical revolution, since these new seed plants are free from water and are evolving towards aerial reproduction. Seeds also provide essential pauses in growth. It can enter a dormant state, i.e. a slowed down state of life, to await favorable external conditions for germination to take place. In this way, seeds can remain alive buried in the soil for several years before germinating. Henceforth, plants no longer need to live in constantly damp habitats and can colonize new regions of the world. The appearance of the first seed plants completely changed our planet. At the end of the Devonian period, the first modern tree appeared. Archaeopteris sank its roots into the wet soils of the Great Swamps 370 million years ago. This plant belongs to the fossil, Progymnosperms, a group that gave rise to today's gymnosperms. It shares many characteristics with seed plants. It developed as early as the end of the Devonian period and remained until the Carboniferous. It became widely established around the globe.
Archaeopteryx is truly a giant of its time, reaching heights of 30 to 40 meters or 130 feet. The width of its stump can reach up to 1.5 meters or 5 feet. Its branches are similar to those of seed plants. Its trunk is made up of lignin and cellulose, and its structure is very similar to that of modern conifers. This wood was new for its time. It provided significant advantages, helping to support the plant and conduct its sap. Broad fronds unfurl at the top, reminiscent of ferns. They are oriented horizontally to capture maximum sunlight and feature remarkable photosynthetic organs. Archaeopteryx branches can be divided into two categories. On the one hand, there are the ordinary vegetative branches, and on the other, the fertile branches that carry the sporangia clusters. Archaeopteryx therefore has both male and female spores, or heterospores, as in today's seed plants. Archaeopteryx is able to grow rapidly, since it has meristematic cells at the top that multiply rapidly. It also has axillary branches, enabling it to create new perennial non-deciduous branches. In this way, the tree remains alive even after the death of its highest tip. Archaeopteryx is a pioneer in other fields, too. It uses layering, a technique whereby one of its branches is buried in the ground to take root. It can then grow on another base. He also invented cuttings, which enable a new tree to grow from a fragment of a branch that is capable of putting down roots in the soil. All these exceptional developments were certainly put in place by Archaeopteryx to counterbalance its difficulties with its mode of reproduction, since it always produces spores. The latter requires very specific conditions, such as a humid environment and the meeting of spores. This performance obviously raises the question of its total disappearance at the beginning of the Carboniferous. Perhaps it consumed large quantities of carbon dioxide, helping to reduce the greenhouse effect that led to an ice age? Or was it outcompeted by the first seed plants, which began to develop at the same time? Archaeopteryx is one of the first lengths in the evolution of a group called the seed ferns. The first plants to produce seeds rather than spores are more like ferns, which is why they are called seed ferns. Seed ferns thrive in drier habitats. They are the ancestors of the plants that dominate almost every habitat on Earth today. And among them are some real giants. Originating in the Triassic period, the Benetitales are a magnificent group of palm-like seed plants. Many have large branched woody trunks. Their leaves resemble those of modern cycads. They produce cone-shaped structures, certainly appreciated by insects. Their reproductive system is intermediate between that of gymnosperms and angiosperms. There is a naked ovule, but it is surrounded by flower-like parts, like petals, the whole strongly resembling the angiosperm flower. Benetitale species can reach several meters in height. Medulla sails are seed ferns that grow on tropical or subtropical plains. Shaped like small trees, they can reach several meters in height. This group greatly diversified in the Carboniferous period. The leaves of Bandula sails take the form of gigantic fronds that can measure up to 7 meters or 23 feet in length. 
Their reproductive system consists of thick seeds, measuring several centimeters in diameter, and rather massive pollen grains. These plants therefore need the help of dispersing and pollinating animals. Medulla sails have conquered the whole world. The main trunk is made of flexible pith, an innovation in vessel systems. As a result, these plants can produce strong stems without needing much wood. Chordates are truly giant plants that thrive in a wide variety of habitats. They can be found in mangrove-like marshes, where they emerge from seawater or at the edge of tropical wetlands, but also in drier habitats. The largest specimens can reach up to 45 meters or 150 feet in height. Chordata leaves resemble long ribbons and are composed of parallel veins. They can grow up to 1 meter or 3 feet long and 15 centimeters or 6 inches wide. The leaves are arranged helically on the branches and have stomata only on their inner surface. The most massive specimens prefer higher, well-drained areas, while medium-sized specimens grow in humid zones. Glossopteridales are a group of trees whose leaves have been found in remote areas of the world, providing evidence of continental drift over a long period of time. Glossopteridales' leaves are tongue-shaped and can be as long as a cucumber. Deciduous leaves fall off in autumn, with new ones sprouting every spring. The leaves adorn tree branches that can reach up to 30 meters or 100 feet in height. Their mode of reproduction classifies them as close relatives or ancestors of the angiosperms. Pollen and seeds are produced in different organs attached to separate leaves. The pollen organs take the form of leaves bearing bags or cone-shaped clusters. Roots also have a characteristic morphology. They have spaced partitions that give the appearance of a spinal column and a lobed wood in the center, with internal space between the lobes. This is an exceptional morphology among plants. Glossopteridales are dominant plants in the flora and are widely diversified. They were present during part of the Permian, then tended to disappear at the end of the Triassic. The genus that inspired the group's name and is also its highest and best known member, is Glossopterus. These various seed ferns are the precursors of the gymnosperms, a group of cone and seed-bearing plants. Gymnosperms are divided into groups according to their kinship. Among them are the netophytes, Although they may appear very different from one another, they have a particularity in their water transport system, which closely resembles that of flowering plants. Ginkgo, also known as the 40 square tree, belongs to another group of gymnosperms known as ginkophytes. This group, which existed some 270 million years ago, has seen all its other species become extinct. Only the ginkgo represents this group today. During the Permian, these plants flourished all over the globe, expanding rapidly during the Jurassic. Following the Quaternary glaciations, only the ginkgo biloba species survived, in rare regions with milder temperatures. It is now considered a living fossil. This is a slender tree with a pyramidal habit. 
It is adorned with beautiful fan-shaped leaves that turn a sumptuous golden color in autumn. It can reach heights of up to 40 meters, or 130 feet for the largest specimens. Ginkgo is slow-growing and very long-lived. Some of these trees can live for over 3,000 years. The trunk bark of young specimens is smooth at first, then cracks and splits over time. It is brown to gray in color. Branches extend from the trunk at almost right angles. Ginkgo has a distinctive leaf shape. They have two palm-like lobes with no central veins. The rather green color turns yellow in autumn. Leaves can reach up to 15 centimeters or six feet in length. These trees are either male or female. Pollination takes place in spring and the fertilized eggs mature in autumn. This giant prehistoric tree has withstood all the obstacles placed in its path over all these millions of years. It was even the first tree to recover from the Hiroshima atomic bomb. It has enormous resistance to parasites, natural predators, and disease. As soon as a fire breaks out nearby and it senses the heat rising, it will fireproof itself. Ginkgo produces a protective substance that makes its bark non-flammable. During the Devonian period 380 million years ago, forests of trees 10 to 30 meters, or 100 feet high, covered the Earth's surface in its wettest regions. The Carboniferous period, however, was the one most marked by the first giants of plant origin. The Carboniferous period began around 359 million years ago and lasted until 299 million years ago. It owes its name to the abundant coal production that began in its second half. At this time, two great continents formed the globe, Laurasia to the north and Gondwana to the south. At the end of the previous era, their collision gave rise to a supercontinent called Pangaea, surrounded by the immense Panthalassa Ocean. The collision created a clearly visible mountain range between the two ancient continents. The Hercynian Range is the eastern part. To the west are the Appalachian and Mauritanian Ranges. All these mountains are located at the equator. The climate is mild and humid. Swampy forests develop at their foot, forming the future coal reservoirs that gave rise to the name Carboniferous. Indeed, it was during this geological period that the majority of the world's coal reserves were formed, coal that is still mined today. The origin of this black or dark brown rock lies in the degradation of plant organic matter. At the end of the Devonian period, sea levels were generally falling, but during the Carboniferous period, they gradually rose leading to the formation of epicontinental seas. The Earth's average temperature is around 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit, making it an ideal breeding ground for abundant, luxuriant flora. Ancestors of vascular plants can be found here, including ferns and ginkgos. Forest stretch as far as the eye can see, with a cocktail of deciduous and coniferous trees, lycopods, and seed plants. This environment is not only conducive to plant growth, but the new abundance of food attracts many animals, some of which were originally marine. They leave their environment and gradually evolve in this new terrestrial environment. This expansion of forests onto continental surfaces marks the Earth's entry into the Oxygen Age. All plants use photosynthesis. 
the concentration of oxygen in the air increases considerably. It reaches 35% compared with 21% today. This hyperoxygenated atmosphere benefits arthropods, a family that includes insects, spiders, crustaceans, and certain vertebrates that evolve to gigantic sizes. Meganeura, for example, is a giant dragonfly with a length of around 30 centimeters or 12 inches and a wingspan of over 70 centimeters or 28 inches. It is one of the largest insects that has ever existed. It lives close to water and evolves in tropical forests. This fearsome super predator thrives in vegetation that reflects its image, large and flourishing. Because this widespread gigantism affects both flora and fauna. The first ferns appeared in the Devonian period around 400 million years ago. They became one of the Earth's dominant plant groups during the Carboniferous period, around 100 million years later. Like giant tree-like lycopods, ferns form vast green swamps all over the world. Ferns are all different. Some have large fronds and grow into imposing trees, while others are as small as a fingernail. Tropical ferns grow rapidly, while tree ferns found in cooler locations develop more slowly. It's this wide diversity that explains their success, as they are able to thrive in different habitats. The Lepidodendron is one of the first plant giants known to the Earth. It measures up to 30 meters or 100 feet in height. Its trunk can reach a width of 2 meters or 7 feet at the base. Its gigantic crown rises to a broccoli-like shape. Its leaves are needle-shaped, sprouting directly from the trunk in large green spirals. When they fall, they scar the trunk. Like other lycopods, Lepidodendron has spores which are produced in the conical structure at the end of the branches. Alongside Lepidodendron, Sigillaria is gradually covering the world's continental surface. This tree has a large scaly trunk topped by spiky foliage. Although its trunk resembles that of a tree, it's actually made up of tightly packed leaves rather than wood. But if there's one type of vegetation that strongly marked the Carboniferous period, it's ferns. Although ferns first appeared in the Devonian, it was during the Carboniferous period that they became one of the most highly developed plant groups. While giant lycopods resemble trees, ferns form immense green swamps and cover the entire Earth. Watieza trees are among the oldest known trees. They belong to a group of plants that are ancestors of ferns and horsetails. They closely resemble the tree ferns and palms that remain today. They can reach 8 meters or 26 feet in height. Watieza has fronds rather than leaves. They are located vertically in the crown and inserted like helices into the trunk. The trunk is probably formed by the loss of fronds, leaving scar marks near the crown. The trunk is rather thin, with longitudinal grooves. The roots are inverted conical. In this way, numerous small roots can penetrate perpendicularly into the soil, enabling the plant to remain upright despite its large size. As for the fronds, they are produced in large numbers and, once dead, form an organic mat enabling animals to thrive.
Sauronius, like Watieza, is a fern that could grow to the size of a tree, peaking at 10 meters or 33 feet in height. Its trunk is wide and thick, measuring up to 1 meter or 3 feet. Its magnificent green fronds sprout from the top and reach up to 3 meters or 10 feet in length. They develop from supple, coiled buds called crosses. One of the characteristics of this giant plant is that it has no real trunk, but rather a thick root mantle formed by numerous rootlets. These rootlets grow from a central stem, which is located at the height of Saronius. This stem diminishes in size as you move down the trunk. This is why, at the base, the mantle is composed entirely of roots. Some plants have a mantle measuring up to one meter, or three feet in diameter, at the base of the tree. And within this mantle, a whole ecosystem develops. In fact, other plant species such as climbers and epiphytes live in this mantle. Because Sauronius leaves can grow up to 3 meters or 10 feet in length, their attachment bases are massive to support the weight of these large specimens. As they fall, the fronds leave scars on the stem. These are called leaf scars. Sauronius is the ancestor of many large ferns, but none is currently tree-shaped as this specimen was at that time. Horsetails are a genus of plants from the only surviving lineage of a highly diverse Carboniferous group. Today, only herbaceous species remain, whereas in the past, horsetail families also included arborescent species. Horsetails are herbaceous perennials they are also known as ponytail, rat tail, or foxtail. They have a hollow stem and leaves fused into a sheath at the base. Their epidermis is encrusted with silica, which is now used as an abrasive or to clean dishes. Today's horsetails are herbaceous, growing to no more than 60 centimeters. However, during the Carboniferous period, other species were present reaching heights of up to 30 meters or 100 feet. The 20 or so species of horsetail that survive today are living fossils, remnants of once colossal forests. The oldest species found is Pseudoborneia. This primitive horsetail was discovered in the late 1800s it took a century for scientists to realize that this fossil belonged to a single large tree that could grow to around 20 meters or 66 feet in height. Pseudoborneia has a thick straight central trunk from which numerous leafy branches protrude. This giant prehistoric plant offered shelter to the first four-legged animals to venture onto dry land. One of the best-known species of giant tree horsetail is the calamite. Calamites grow up to 30 meters or 100 feet in height and cover vast areas of swamp and sandy banks. In the distance, they can be mistaken for pines, but as you get closer, it's easy to distinguish their tall bamboo-like stems. Calamites have enormous underground branches, called stolons, which enable them to grow new stems in case any are damaged. Their trunks reach up to one meter or three feet in diameter and can thicken with the help of a secondary wood made up of support and reserve elements. The tree's appearance is impressive. The stems are fluted and shiny, leaving scars on the trunk when they fall. Calamite's leaves are unenervate and can be quite impressive in size on the terminal stems. 
The closest modern species to calamites is Equesitem, a horsetail with an arborescent tendency, but which only reaches 2 meters or 7 feet in height, with a trunk 10 centimeters or 4 inches in diameter. A relatively modest size compared to our Carboniferous giant. If we were wandering through such a prehistoric forest today, the bristling fronds of the calamites would be deployed over our heads. Calamites have become a major constituent of coal. Another primitive horsetail species that existed during the Carboniferous and Triassic periods is Arthropitus. This plant has a complex branching system for its time, with numerous branches. This giant can grow up to 15 meters or 50 feet in height. It has at least three orders of axis that form a wide crown. While horsetails once formed fast-growing thickets and rapidly covered the Earth's swamps for hundreds of millions of years, Today, these same forests are sparse. Horsetails have been replaced by flowering plants. Climate change and the drying up of the land have probably led to the disappearance of many species. Today, although modern horsetails are much smaller than their extinct prehistoric ancestors, some species described as living fossils can still reach heights of up to 5 meters or 17 feet. These include Equisetum, Myriachetum, and Equisetum giganteum. The former is a giant living fossil and one of the tallest modern horsetail species. The plant produces numerous long slender shoots, decorated with widely spaced brown stripes from which slight tufts of green leaves emerge. Equisetum, Meriochetum, forms large groves. The second, Equisetum giganteum, is literally known as giant horsetail. Compared to the primitive giant horsetails, it remains relatively modest. But at 5 meters or 17 feet, it's the one that comes closest to the image we have of prehistoric forests. What's more, if supported by other plants, some of these stems can grow to more than 5 meters or 17 feet. These are small and slender, measuring just a few centimeters in diameter. This explosion of life and gigantism was short-lived. 305 million years ago, the climate became drier. Many plant species disappeared. The lush tropical forests break up into smaller and smaller islands. They drifted apart and eventually disappeared altogether. Global forest cover is declining by 53%. This is when a rock forms, leaving us with a most precious legacy. When plant matter is immersed in water or mud, then compressed and heated for long periods, it turns into a rock called coal. This process is called coalification. The oldest Carboniferous plants form debris, which is then covered by younger plants. They are buried under sediment. Compressed under layers of rock and subjected to a temperature of 200 degrees Celsius or 392 degrees Fahrenheit, emanating from the Earth's core, they transform into peat. Over the following millions of years, the peat loses its hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen components until only carbon remains. Coal is formed. The stars of the Mesozoic era are undoubtedly the dinosaurs. At first glance, the background may seem unimportant, but it's no less important. 
At once familiar in appearance and different in floristic composition, the vegetation of this period features different classes of plants, some of which we still encounter today. The composition of vegetation is one thing, but its appearance is quite another. In fact, the shape of plants is conditioned by two factors. They must obtain water, but they must also receive light. These two imperatives are usually in opposite directions, one to the ground, the other to the sky. As a result, the shape of plants evolves, forcing them to balance their tissues and their capacity for synthesis. Moreover, competition is fierce, as all plants use the same energy resource, light. So it's not surprising that over the course of Earth's history, plants with rather distant systematic affinities have nonetheless adopted similar forms. We speak of trees, lianas, grasses, shrubs. In the Mesozoic, as today, vegetation is influenced by the annual temperature and rainfall scenario. Another important factor is the development of herbivorous animals, which increased dramatically during the Mesozoic, notably with the gigantic dinosaurs. Flora is under major evolutionary pressure. Plants have to develop defense mechanisms such as trichomes, which are outgrowths, phytoliths, which are small abrasive mineral particles, and resins. The first ferns which appeared in the Devonian period reached their peak in the Carboniferous period and thanks to their diversity, continued to dominate the flora until the end of the Cretaceous period. They were only surpassed by the angiosperms. The great lycopods that once dominated the earth no longer have any large representatives. Their shape is closer to that of today's plants. Deep in cool, damp woods in tropical forests, we find Cyathea, a genus of tree fern. It surpasses other plants in terms of size, thanks to its long, slender trunk that can reach over 15 meters or 50 feet in height. Large green fronds protrude from its crown. Leaves can reach several meters in length a new order of plants will develop, the cycads. Cycads are an order of gymnosperm plants. They comprise some 350 species. Although they resemble palms and have physical characteristics similar to ferns, they belong to an ancient group of flowerless seed plants. The first cycads appeared during the Carboniferous period. The first plants had simple leaves and parallel veins. The cycad group really exploded and diversified in the Mesozoic, alongside the dinosaurs. Subsequently, these plants survived hungry dinosaurs, ice ages, and asteroids. Most of them have thick woody trunks and fern-like crowns of rigid leaves. These trees are slow-growing but long-lived, with some specimens reaching an estimated age of 2,000 years. The largest known specimen reaches 20 meters or 66 feet in height with a trunk 50 centimeters or 20 inches in diameter. This is Lepidosomia hopi. This gigantic cyca thrives in tropical climates. It is a dioecious tree with male and female flowers on separate stems. 
Its trunk is branched and topped by a crown of large spreading leaves measuring up to 2.5 meters, or 8 feet in length. Another species sets a record for the largest diameter, measuring 1.5 meters, or 5 feet. This is the Saika thuarsi. Cycads have rather thick roots. Their trunk is, in most cases, unbranched, although it may divide in two in some older specimens. Their scaly appearance is due to leaf scars, the marks left by fallen leaves. Their green leaves are leathery and shiny. And cephalartos are prehistoric plants that closely resemble tree ferns. In their early years, they form a large clump of leaves, measuring 3 meters or 10 feet in diameter. This remains relatively close to the ground on a spherical trunk that thickens over the years. The trunk then lengthens until it reaches a height of 15 meters or 50 feet. It is topped by leaves arranged in a spiral, like those of palm trees. The trunk can reach up to 1 meter or 3 feet in diameter, with an underground section. The roots are thick and fleshy. Leaves range in color from light gray to dark green. They are evergreen and stiff, ending in a thorn. Macrozamia more is a hardy species of cycad that can already be seen on Earth 300 million years ago. Once again, it should not be confused with ferns and palms, despite its strong resemblance. The plant comes in two states, male with a pollen-bearing cone and female with ovules. The male and female cones attract all kinds of pollinators, some tiny insects, known as thrips, have even become totally dependent on cycads for reproduction, since they can't reproduce anywhere else. They are therefore obliged to stay close to these plants in order to survive. Macrozemia more can reach heights of up to 9 meters or 30 feet. The diameter of its trunk is between 50 and 80 centimeters, or between 20 inches and 30 inches. Its leaves can measure up to 2.5 meters or 8 feet in length. It thrives in tropical and subtropical climates and needs well-drained soil to thrive. At the beginning of the Mesozoic, during the Triassic, Seeds were so successful that seed-producing gymnosperm plants dominated the Earth. Gymnosperms comprise four main groups, netophytes, ginkophytes, cycads, and conifers. At this time, the climate is hot and more or less dry depending on the region, and the plant world is becoming poorer. On the other hand, Conifers, which are better adapted to this climate, reclaim the ecological niches left vacant. The first species have seeds that swirl towards the ground, enabling them to stay in the air longer. This means they can travel long distances before landing and germinating. Conifers are defined as seed-bearing vascular plants that take on a cone-like structure, hence the name conifer, meaning cone-bearing. Conifers are woody plants and are found almost everywhere in the world. Conifers have survived many events, from continental drift, climate change and volcanic eruptions, to the appearance of flowering plants although the latter will cause their decline. These giants have existed on our planet for over 300 million years, 
and are among the oldest living seed plants. Today's conifers are breaking unprecedented records. A yew-leaved sequoia called Hyperion is the largest living organism on Earth. At 800 years old, it reaches a height of 116 meters, or 380 feet. Another giant sequoia specimen, named General Sherman, boasts a trunk 11 meters or 36 feet in diameter at its base. So gigantic, you could fit a coach inside. Another record is the bristlecone pine, one specimen of which is over 4,800 years old. It's one of the oldest living organisms. The first conifers were relatively modest in size compared with the giants we see today. Examples include Thucydia and Voltsiale. Thucydia looks like a miniature version of a modern Araucaria, also known as Monkey's Despair. Some of today's colossal conifers may have evolved from smaller plants like this one. It could grow to around 2 meters or 7 feet in height. At a time when many plants found it difficult to survive, Voltsial, a hardy group of conifers, made its mark. Among them, Walchia is characterized by a morphology in the form of a long trunk, without branches or leaves. The Wolemi pine is a conifer, the only species in the Wolemia genus. This tree towers over the dinosaurs at a height of 40 meters or 131 feet. Its distinctive bark is dark brown and covered with nodules that resemble tiny bubbles. The branches hang horizontally. The leaves are short, almost needle-like. Wolemi pine is the only tree species that produces only unbranched branches. They remain on the tree for only 5 to 10 years before falling off, along with all the leaves attached to them. This plant is monoecious, meaning that both male and female cones are produced on the same tree. These are, however, quite separate. Until 1994, this plant was known only from fossils. At that time, a living population was discovered in a rainforest within a national park in Australia. Wolemi pine, thought to have disappeared with the dinosaurs, is finally still with us. Forty-five million years ago, the majestic Metasequoia tree dominated the land north of the Arctic Circle. This giant plant can reach 50 meters or 165 feet in height. Although the Metasequoia was thought to be extinct, a new species was discovered in China in the 1940s. This conifer has a distinctive feature. It has deciduous leaves which fall off in winter. In fact, at the first frosts of winter, its leaves take on a light coppery hue, then fall to the ground. The Metasequoia has a large trunk that can reach up to 2 meters or 7 feet in diameter. Skyadopitus is a unique tree. It has no close living ancestor. This living fossil has existed for around 230 million years. During this period, its forests spread throughout the Northern Hemisphere. This giant can reach up to 27 meters or 90 feet in height. The tree has a dense conical shape with cardboard-like bark. What look like leaves are actually modified stems. These are special structures called cladodes. Cladodes are leaf-like twigs that perform the same functions such as photosynthesis.
Over the years, conifers have evolved to reach colossal sizes. The giant sequoia appeared 200 million years ago. Giant redwoods are native to the western United States, mainly California. They have survived through the ages and are among the tallest and oldest trees in the world. The development and growth sequence of giant sequoias spans millennia, and some extant specimens are thousands of years old. Early in their lives, giant sequoias grow vigorously and vertically, with a distinctive conical shape. Once the tree reaches 100 years of age or more, it tends to grow in diameter, with a rounded top. Its foliage consists of pointed needles that can reach between 3 and 15 millimeters. When touched, they give off an aniseed-like scent. Its wood is rich in tannin and highly resistant to fungi and insects, so that branches that have fallen to the ground will not be destroyed by them. Its high tannin content makes this wood highly resistant to fire. The tree's roots can extend up to 40 meters or 130 feet. They are monoecious trees, meaning that male and female flowers cohabit on the same tree. Giant redwoods comprise two main species. The giant sequoia, Sequoia dendron giganteum, and the yew-leaved sequoia, Sequoia dendron sempervirens. The yew leaf sequoia is an extraordinary tree that grows in humid coastal areas. It can reach heights of up to 115 meters or 380 feet. Although fast growing, these trees can take centuries to mature. The oldest specimens reach 2,000 years, so they are living organisms with an exceptional lifespan. Sequoia dendron giganteum is also known as the giant sequoia. Although its height and width make it one of the most massive trees on the planet, it doesn't hold the record for the tallest tree either, but rather for the one that achieves the greatest volumes. With an average height of between 50 and 85 meters, or between 165 feet and 280 feet. With a trunk diameter of up to 8 meters or 27 feet, these specimens can reach a volume of 1400 cubic meters or 50,000 cubic feet, and an estimated mass of over 2,000 tons. They are veritable colossi. Another type of conifer found in prehistoric forests is the Araucaria. These trees first appeared in the Jurassic period around 200 million years ago. Araucarias thrive in tropical and subtropical forests, although some species can also be found in temperate regions. Araucarias comprise several species, including the Araucaria aracana, also known as Monkey's Despair, native to Chile and Argentina. These trees are often appreciated for their distinctive shape and characteristic cones. They have survived through different geological periods and have witnessed the evolution of life on Earth for millions of years. These contemporaries of the dinosaurs must certainly have grown tall. From their heights of 100 meters or 330 feet, they nevertheless tend to take their time growing up with a life expectancy of up to 2,000 years. Araucarias have a distinctive geometry. The architecture of their branches is extremely symmetrical. The branches are arranged in tiers, forming a regular crown evenly distributed around the trunk. The trunk grows vertically without branching, this primitive growth characteristic is no longer found in the modern plant kingdom. Their nickname is Monkey Despair, 
because monkeys can't climb these trees. Indeed, Araucarias have developed a highly dissuasive foliage so that as few animals as possible can reach their branches. They have scales, rigid leaves, and even sharp needles that can injure anyone who ventures onto them. In fact, it was their unattractive scales that saved them from the herbivorous dinosaurs. Around 140 million years ago, a veritable biological revolution took place. The flourishing forests of gymnosperms had to contend with an entirely new type of plant, the first flowering plants. Such was their success that they changed the Earth's landscape forever. Flowering plants, also known as angiosperms, are terrestrial plants in which the ovules and seeds are contained in a closed cavity, as opposed to gymnosperms in which the latter are exposed. It was during the Jurassic period, as the climate became more humid, that flowering plants developed. They settled in ecological niches that conifers had failed to colonize. At first, they are found in wetlands associated with fresh water. Angiosperms then developed in the undergrowth of floodplains before finally taking over coastal marshes. After a few tens of millions of years, flowering plants were already abundant and highly diversified. By the end of the Cretaceous, plant landscapes had undergone profound changes, with angiosperms becoming the dominant plant group. The first flowers to appear resemble those of the magnolia. These ancient plants belong to a group known as the Magnoliaceae. In addition to magnolias, it includes some fascinating plants, some of which have rapidly grown to impressive sizes. Alongside them, ancient species such as water lilies and woody plants are among the first groups to branch out in the family tree of flowering plants. These paleo plants are known as basal angiosperms. Liriodendron is also known as a tulip plant because its large flowers are tulip shaped. This superb plant existed as far back as 90 million years ago, during the Cretaceous period. Liriodendron can reach heights of 60 meters, or 200 feet, and its trunk reaches around 3 meters, or 10 feet, in diameter. Its deciduous leaves are indented and can measure from 10, or 4 inches, to 16 centimeters, or 7 inches. They are composed of four lobes, giving it a tulip shape. Foliage is yellow-green in spring, turning yellow in autumn. Fruits appear after 20 years. Ostrobalia is a rare woody vine found in the undergrowth of tropical forests. It can grow up to 15 meters or 50 feet. Its stems wrap around tall trees, twisting up to the canopy. Its blue-green leaves unfurl two by two. The flowers are pale yellow-green covered with tiny purple dots. Like other pleasant-smelling flowers, these are close to rotting and attract flies. These fruits are orange and pear-shaped. The Elysium genus includes trees and shrubs that thrive in shady forests. They have distinctive flowers with long outward curling petals. They can reach 15 meters or 50 feet in height. Their star-shaped fruits expel seeds explosively. Victoria is a giant water lily and one of the most astonishing and beautiful of all plants. 
Its leaves form vast mats of gigantic disks that float on the surface of lakes. They can reach up to 3 meters or 10 feet in diameter. The edge of the leaf is raised, but it has a slit to act as a gutter during tropical storms. This water lily is so strong that it can bear a weight of almost 80 kilograms or 180 pounds. The flowers are magnificent. White in color, they open up and attract beetles, which remain trapped there overnight. The next day, they turn pink and release the beetles. Mute witnesses to a bygone era, prehistoric giant plants still influence today's ecosystem. The sheer size and diversity of these immense plants have shaped the face of the Earth as we know it today. They have influenced biodiversity, the water cycle, and climatic equilibrium. Lycopods, ferns, cycads, conifers, and flowering plants have all played a crucial role in the evolution of ecosystems. These plants have developed adaptation mechanisms, survival strategies, and ecological interactions that have enabled them to thrive through the ages. Giant plants convert solar energy into organic matter through photosynthesis. Their gigantic size means that they are capable of supplying massive quantities of biomass, which forms the basis of the food chain. They are therefore enormous primary producers. What's more, they contribute to ecological balance. They influence the climate by sequestering carbon and contribute to soil quality when they decompose. The larger the plant, the more diverse and secure the habitat for many species. Whether insects or small mammals, giant ferns and conifers provide new ecological niches in which to evolve. Plants have edible parts, such as leaves, seeds, and fruit, which are an important source of food for many species. Herbivorous dinosaurs, for example, were largely dependent on these giant plants for their survival. The influence of prehistoric giant plants persists in the very structure of our biosphere. The plant and animal kingdoms are intricately interconnected. It is therefore essential to preserve biological diversity and natural balances. This millennia-old plant history makes us aware that conserving nature and preserving our environment must be a priority. <laughs>